Thank you, Gracias. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. It's wonderful to see so much depth and um, seriousness of focus on this very important topic. I was asked to speak specifically about gardens in the United States. So I am going to do that from the point of view of scholarship, which is what I am most involved with. I run the Library of American Landscape History. We are publishers of books on important American landscape architects and places. Appreciation for cultural landscapes in the United States might be traced to a moonlit night in 1853 when Louisa Bird Cunningham caught a glimpse of Mount Vernon from the Potomac River and felt distress at the state of its neglect. This is what it looked like. She wrote to her daughter, Anne Cunningham, to urge her to take action to save the homestead of America's founding president. In response, Anne formed the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Her intention was to raise the funds necessary to buy the decrepit house and surrounding gardens and farm fields. Anne vowed to restore George Washington's beloved estate and eventually, with the help of patriots across the nation, she did. This is what some of the farmland looks like today. It's very beautiful. This successful effort led to other initiatives to identify and save places of historical importance. Cultural leaders of the young nation held fervent beliefs about material commemoration attitudes similar to those in post-revolutionary France that fostered a, quote, cult of ancestors in the wake of iconoclastic rejections of church and king. It is not surprising that it was a group of self-directed women that sparked the connection between the preservation of place and the commemoration of political ideals in the United States. Gardens in the U.S. have traditionally been part of the domestic sphere and therefore the purview of women. The concept of the cultural landscape was expanded in the 1880s when Charles Eliot wrote a series of articles for Garden and Forest in which he sought to interpret the goals and techniques of landscape architecture for a wide audience. In the series introduction, Eliot explained his motivations. Quote, Boston and her surrounding sister cities grow continually. Farm after farm and garden after garden are invaded by streets, sewers, and water pipes, owners being fairly compelled to sell lands, which are taxed more and more heavily. Before destruction overtakes the few old seats now remaining, it will be well to make some sort of record of their character and beauty. And this is one of the illustrations from his article. Eliot took a step further in an 1890 article, The Waverly Oaks, a plan for their preservation for the people, in which he argued passionately for the protection of a stand of aboriginal trees overlooking a series of ponds outside Boston. This place of primeval beauty has, is the microphone okay? Is the volume okay? All right. This place of primeval beauty had been celebrated by poets and painters, adding an overlay of cultural associations to the natural scenery with its more than usual refreshing power. This is a painting by Winslow Homer. He went on to propose a new nonprofit organization to conserve the Waverly Oaks and other culturally important landscapes. 
in his word, such an entity would, quote, hold small and well-distributed parcels of land free from taxes, just as the public library holds books and the art museums, art museum pictures, end quote. His efforts laid the groundwork for the Massachusetts tr Trustees of Public Reservations, now known simply as the Trustees of Reservations. It was the first regional land trust in the world, and it became the model for the British uh, uh, Historic Trust for Preservation and many other land trusts. So this is 1891 now. Among the many properties the trustees of reservations went on to acquire was Nomkek, the summer home of Joseph Hodges Choate, a prominent lawyer who had served as ambassador to England. The reason that Nomkeg became part of the trustees' holdings, however, had more to do with its artistic quality than its association with Joseph. So we're beginning to see a switch now from political affiliation to a definition of landscape as expression of character and beauty and aesthetics. The Berkshire Cottage was designed in 1885 by a young Stanford White, the architect, and its gardens were a 1920s and 1930s collaboration between Joseph's daughter, Mabel Choate, who had inherited the estate, and the landscape architect, Fletcher Steele. Despite the trustees' good intentions, when I first visited Nomkeg in 1983, 25 years after Mabel Choate's death, the landscape was in a state of disrepair. Trees were overgrown, paths eroding, and pools leaking. This is actually a more contemporary picture. I wasn't going to show you a picture of what it looked like. Determined to find out more about the creative genius behind this place, I discovered 100,000 plans, drawings, photographs, and letters from Steele's 60-year practice held by the Library of Congress. As I studied the documents and tracked down more gardens by Steele, I became convinced that he was one of the most important landscape architects of the early 20th century. Someone disagrees with me. No, I'm kidding. I'm hearing a peacock, I think. At the time, there was nothing published on Steele or on any other American landscape architect, with the exception of Charles Eliot, whose biography had been written by his father. The specific problem before Steele at Nomkeg in 1926 was how to create a new outdoor room from which to enjoy the Berkshire scenery. He solved the challenge with Venetian-style posts linked by swags of rope. The posts defined the space, framing the view to Monument Mountain and effectively appropriating it into the garden experience. And here we touch on a, a core principle of uh, late 19th and early 20th century American gardens, which is the connection between culture, the design space, and nature. OK, thank you. I, too much. Um, the, um, the object in many of these gardens was to uh, devise ways to connect the viewer with what seemed to be untrammeled nature beyond. When this view was threatened by development, many years later, the trustees of reservations purchased the land in question. You see the distant mountain is now belongs to the trustees as well, which brings up interesting questions about, well, where do you define uh, the perimeter of a landscape design? Steele furnished the room with elements that reflected Mabel Choate's own interests and travels, personalizing it in a way that few professionally designed American gardens of the day had been. 
He went on to create many other gardens on the property, including the Chinese Temple Garden, which was inspired by memories of his and Mabel Choate's trips to Asia. The best known feature at Namkeg is a birch grove surrounding a flight of steps that Steele laid out as a shortcut to the cutting garden. He used modern industrial materials and strong color in his art deco interpretation of the Italian water feature, resulting in an uncannily beautiful design in which nature seems to imitate art. I went on to write a book about Steele's work and the principles motivating it. The book proved helpful to the stewards of Namkeg, who for the first time had a history that they could use to promote interest in Steele, and that also served as a guide to difficult preservation dilemmas, the dynamic nature of the landscape, which is continually moving through cycles of growth and decay, requires an understanding of complex and at times contradictory artistic principles. In this scholarship, I applied paradigms derived from the traditional study of the history and of painting and architecture. I was an art historian. Primary among these was the idea that a landscape practitioner's oeuvre could be analyzed chronologically as a comprehensive development. Steele's life's work was well suited to this approach. He regarded himself as an artist, and like any good artist, he searched relentlessly for forms that would express the larger cultural currents of his time, even as he explored more idiosyncratic applications of the principles he regarded as fundamental to his art, relating to color, line, form, and space. I applied other cultural perspectives to the subject, who were the people who commissioned the work? How did they use it? And how did it change over time? And the, the, I should say, this it was one of Fletcher Steele's glass slides that he used to um, lecture. It, it's from the 1925 Paris um, Arts um, uh, Exposition in Paris. And this is an example of what some of these ideas, how they were expressed in his own art. The Steele biography inspired new preservation initiatives at Nam Keg and at other landscapes he designed, including the Camden Public Library Amphitheater, this is in Maine, which was recently restored with a combination of private and town funds. Like Nam Keg, this landscape had fallen into disrepair, and a lack of understanding of its defining principles had led to the introduction of new elements, such as brightly covered, colored flowers, which they had planted in the tops of the tripods, that directly contradicted them. Sustained research revealed that in his 1930 layout of the small park, Steele had strictly limited his palette of materials to a minimum. And this, in other respects, he had been influenced by recent developments in French modernist gardens. In particular, he was impressed by new spatial alignments between gardens and buildings. And here you see the footprint of the library, which is quite small. It's over on the left-hand side, and the U-shaped amphitheater. Steele used the iconoclastic idea of bending the access between the library and the amphitheater to set up a desirable view to the harbor beyond. This slide is from 1930. Realizing that they possessed what was arguably one of the first modernist gardens in the United States, Local citizens became excited about restoring the library landscape, and they successfully sought National Historic Landmark status for it. Nomkeg has also been awarded this status, and it's the highest designation, the highest national designation in the United States. In the years after the Steele book was published, I went on to found an organization, the Library of American Landscape History, with the goal of fostering new scholarship about the men and women who had created superb gardens, parks, and park systems, suburbs, and institutional grounds across the continent. 
This is some of the books we've published. We've now published 35 books. Scholarship about other landscape architects and LALH books has had far-reaching effects. The Gardens of Ellen Biddle Shipman, published in 1996, brought the work of this obscure woman landscape practitioner to the attention of a wide audience. New insights into the distinguishing characters of her work led to the restoration of several gardens designed by her. This is a small garden uh, she designed for a larger estate um, uh, in Akron, Ohio. The best known of Shipman's gardens is Longview in New Orleans, which underwent a comprehensive restoration shortly after the LALH book was published. In the mid-1930s, the estate Shipman designed for Edgar and Edith Stern was the site of later designs by William and Jeffrey Platt, and these designs have been preserved as well. Here's some memories of the Alhambra. Another uh, key notion in American gardens of this era was a wholesale, uh, not wholesale, but appropriation of other traditions in landscape design. The notion of landscape design is a layered enterprise, a continuum that often spanned decades. And of course, uh, in Europe, it spans centuries. Uh, be, but it became an organizing principle of LALH scholarship. A Shipman garden designed in the 1930s for Nina and Arthur Kummer in Jacksonville, Florida, had fallen into disrepair in the by the 1990s. Shortly after the Shipman book was published, however, a local volunteer recognized the Kummer name on the designer's client list, which we published in the book and a full restoration of the garden soon followed. And this, of course, was after considerable study. In the years since, the Kummer Museum of Art and Gardens, the house was turned into a museum. And after they restored the garden, they added Museum of Art and Gardens to their name. They have embraced their role as a steward of other landscape designs on the site in 1903. Going back now, O.C. Simons was commissioned by the family to create a sweep of native trees and shrubs, enhanced with stands of live oaks along the riverfront property. Years later, these plantings were reconfigured by the Philadelphia-based firm of Thomas Meehan and Sons and a more structured architectural framework added. So you're getting these layers of designers. On an adjacent property, the Olmsted brothers firm was commissioned to create elaborate gardens in the 1930s. Both these garden areas were recently restored and together with the Shipman Garden, so now they've got three gardens, draw museum visitors who are encouraged to interpret them as works of art, just as they do the painting and sculpture held in the indoor galleries. So going back to Charles Eliot's core notion that here is a cultural institution, a museum, safeguarding these works of art for the public. The field of American landscape design took a leap forward in 2000 with the publication of Pioneers of American Landscape Design, an encyclopedia that featured biographical essays of 160 American practitioners. This collaborative work, we collaborated on it with the National Park Service, and there were about 40 different contributors, gave historians and landscape stewards a basis for many new lines of historical inquiry. For the first time, researchers could see the breadth of accomplishments of a great number of American landscape architects, and they were designing in many fields, not, not just gardens. In the years following the publication of Pioneers, rising interest in the history of suburban planning, cemetery design, and a mid 20th century program aimed at modernizing the national parks called Mission 66 provided the basis for LH books that addressed these topics too. In 2007, LALH published A Genius for a Place, 
which identified some of the most important landscape designs from the first third of the 20th century, a particularly fertile period in the history of American landscape design, in addition to Steele and Shipman. The book includes biographical chapters on six other landscape architects who were their equals in their responsiveness to nature and artistic inventiveness, two criteria I identified as defining characteristics of an unexamined movement in American landscape architecture. One of the earliest of these practitioners was Warren Manning, an associate of Frederick Law Olmsted, whose practice included every conceivable form of landscape design. I was particularly interested in Manning's wild gardens, a type of landscape that he regarded as uniquely American. This is actually not an example of, a, of a, one of his wild gardens. There are portions of it that are, but this is um, a more pastoral, picturesque landscape that was laid out on the, um, in central Connecticut beginning around the turn of the century, and Manning worked on it through the 1930s. It's now in private hands. One of Manning's largest wild gardens forms the centerpiece of Stan Hewitt in Akron, Ohio, a 1911 estate that opened to the public as a nonprofit historic house museum in 1958. After the death, death of its owner, rubber mogul Frank Cyberling. And you'll find that most house museums in the United States are run as nonprofits. There, Manning dammed springs to create a series of lagoons that became settings for elaborate and varied plantings. He created two long alleys stretching from the ends of the house, one of sycamore, one of white birch. These areas and others throughout the estate have been through several transformations in the years since. In response to popular taste, groundkeepers in the 1980s used the broad lawns for colorful displays of annuals, such as petunias and zinnias, to bring the crowds in. However, as more information about Manning's naturalistic design principles was uncovered as state stewards began replacing gaudy displays with original species and opening views across the Cuyahoga River Valley. Recently, the major gardens at Stan Hewitt were restored to Manning's original plan. And I should say that's with the assistance of the scholarship in, in, a, in the book you just saw, at the cost of many millions of privately raised dollars. Scholarship relating to Manning's methods and significance both inspired and guided the restoration. Other landscape designs by, have, by him have recently come to light as the result of an extensive LALH, that's Library of American Landscape History, research initiative. Here's one of them in the eastern part of uh, Massachusetts, also in private hands. These will form the basis of a book forthcoming next year. Among the most highly regarded American landscape architects of the early 20th century was Beatrix Farrand, whose major work, Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, DC, is a masterpiece of imaginative spatial arrangement and artistic expressiveness. The plan is really quite extraordinary, though. Farron began the project for Mildred and Robert Bliss in 1920 and worked with them on aspects of it until 1940, when the couple donated the mansion and upper gardens to Harvard University. And this is a picture of the Rose Garden at um, Dumbarton Oaks. This is one of the pictures by Carol Besh that were specially commissioned for a genius for place. Part of our philosophy is it's important to continue to take wonderful photographs of these uh, important places, so they too will be part of the historic record. At this juncture, the Blisses made the unfortunate decision to sever the lower park, 
comprising a series of idealized meadows, which Ferrand also laid out, from the comprehensive layout and the transfer ownership of this parcel to the National Park Service. Unassisted by scholarship, and of course this is 1940, um, unassisted by scholarship about the designer's intentions for the lower park, which was to serve as a naturalistic counterpoint to the upper gardens, the National Park Service was at a loss as to how to maintain it, and the parcel entered a period of decline, exacerbated by the invasion of exotic plants and runoff from nearby properties. Here you see a whole hillside taken over by um, what we call porcelain berry. In response to its increasingly derelict state, a group of concerned citizens recently founded the Dumbarton Oaks Park Conservancy, again based on scholarship in the book, with the intention of partnering with the National Park Service to restore what they consider Beatrix, Beatrix Ferrand's finest design. And here are a group of them at that same hillside Modest progress has been made toward this end, largely through flood control measures and the removal of invasive species. They're a long time from replanting. Interest in sustainable design and native plants has brought the Danish-born landscape architect Jens Jensen to the intention of increasing numbers of American gardeners. Among historians, Jensen is best known today for his work in the Chicago Park System. This is a historic picture, but it looks just like this now, Humboldt Park. But he was also an accomplished garden designer who applied his design principles to residential projects in many regions of the United States. Chief among these was an approach to spatial layout based on meadows defined by great masses of native trees and shrubs, which you actually see here, the prairie river functioning almost like a meadow. Working for Edsel and Eleanor Ford in the late 1920s, Edsel Ford is this, was the son of Henry Ford. Jensen laid out a 65-acre estate on a peninsula on Lake St. Clair, north of Detroit. Although many of the trees on his plan have since grown to great large size, the landscape retains many of the brilliant spatial arrangements Jensen specified, including a great meadow aligned with the path of the setting sun. Ford House, which is run as a house museum, is currently searching for a full-time director of landscape an increasing and welcome trend in historic house museums whose grounds are attracting visitors at a greater rate than are their collections of furnishings and art. And here we can return back to one of the earlier principles. We talked about landscapes change, so people keep want to coming, come back and see them. A static collection doesn't, doesn't do that. One of the stresses on these landscapes of this type is that they are expected to function much like parks, which of course require an entirely different sort of planning. They weren't created as parks. Uh, here we're looking from the lagoon, which is entirely artificial, constructed off the lake, up into the Ford's swimming pool. Among the most inventive landscape architects of the early 20th century, was Marion Coffin, who worked extensively in the Northeast with a particular concentration of private clients on Long Island. Most of Coffin's work was private, and most of it has disappeared, as has this wonderful garden, a consequence of the rampant development that occurred in the regions where her client base was concentrated. She is best known today for her design contributions to Winter Tour, a 1,000-acre estate in the Brandywine River, Valley, Brandywine River Valley near Wilmington, Delaware, developed by its owner, H.F. DuPont, over many decades. 
and winter tour like Biltmore also included a village, a working farm, many acres of um, agricultural fields. Here we are at Winter Tour. A consummate plantsman, DuPont designed many of the naturalistic gardens on the estate, but it was Marion Coffin who created the plan for the architecturally determined gardens near the house. Coffin also designed one of the last and most evocative areas on the estate, the April Garden. At the time, DuPont was transforming Winter Tour into a museum of the decorative arts. This is another photograph by Carol Bash from A Genius for Place. Much of Winter Tour's landscape was, was restored in the 1990s. However, during these years, unfortunate additions were also made, largely to attract tourists whose threshold for entertainment was more attuned to Disney World than Meadow Views. This is part of a phenomenon, I don't know if it's happening in Spain, but to create children's gardens, um, like miniature golf courses almost, to pull families in. Despite increasingly rich scholarship on historic American gardens, shocking threats to their survival still, still arise. A recent one targets the Russell Page Garden belonging to the Frick Collection on New York's Fifth Avenue, where museum administrators have announced plans to obliterate the garden with the construction of a six-story tower. Conceived primarily to be viewed from the street, and the museum interior. The 1977 garden is a model of precision and proportion. As one critic writes, a revelation and a breather on the street. Time will tell whether the Frick will be permitted to destroy its own work of art, or whether outraged preservationists will protect this jewel of a garden. And here I think we have a, a case of a museum that collects art that goes up to about the 18th century. So something from 1977 doesn't have a much meaning for them. And a garden, even though it's their garden, they don't see as a work of art. It's not frameable. You can't put it on a pedestal. So there is a very big controversy going on. It's quite interesting. Some people are saying, well, there's Central Park just across the street. Why do you need another garden? A more positive outcome can be reported from Columbus, Indi Indiana, where another landscape jewel, arguably the greatest residential work of the modernist landscape architect, Dan Kiley, was recently bequeathed to the Indianapolis Museum of Art by its owners, J. Irwin and Xenia Miller, who commissioned the garden from Kiley in 1953. So this is really the icon of modernist landscape design in the United States. <clears throat> but it's interesting why they did this. The Millers reasoned that the Indianapolis Museum, which was an, is an hour away, had proved themselves worthy stewards of the American landscape by virtue of their restoration of old fields, a historic estate that the museum restored in the 1990s. And this is part of the museum grounds. The current relationship between the museum and the Miller Garden, which also includes a modernist house by Aero Saarinen, is unique. The house and garden are open to the public on a regular basis, and the museum continues to conduct research into Kylie's artistic principles in order to better understand the work entrusted to them. A forthcoming book on Kylie, published as part of the LALH Masters of Modern Landscape Design series, is part of that effort. And that will be out in a few years. You can see the other uh, landscape architects will be writing about. Gardens may be the most fragile of all cultural landscapes. Here we are back at, at Namkek. <clears throat> 
A misunderstanding of their underlying principles can easily lead, lead to changes that ultimately destroy their artistic coherence and meaning. As trees age and weather patterns shift, stewards face almost impossibly intricate preservation dilemmas. When you add to the forces of nature, the needs, and evolving tastes of visitors, it is almost a miracle that gardens survive with anything remotely like their original design principles intact. The fact that many American gardens do is a reflection of our enduring, even perhaps increasing, fascination with these rich repositories of cultural meaning and our willingness to undertake the scholarship necessary to illuminate them. Thank you.